I told you that Taylor Swift changed music forever, and no, I don't mean by pioneering her own brand of folksy yet accessible pop rock. I mean that she actually changed the way that music gets made and the way that artists are able to monetize the art that they create. It's actually true. When people look back on this age of music, they're going to think about the before Taylor Swift age and the after Taylor Swift age. Because as she found out the hard way, being a rock star comes with a lot of perks, but there's also a dark side. Whatever time the deed took place, a cavity wasn't there. No, not that dark. But some of the most legendary names in music have been screwed by terrible deals with recording companies. Bad contracts and greedy labels have left artists like Rick James broke while companies made hundreds of millions of dollars on their art. And Taylor Swift's most recent album, Fearless, Taylor's version, arrived at number one on the Billboard 200 and promptly broke a bunch of industry records. This is nothing new for Swift. She's been a star since she was a teenager. But it's the way that she achieved these milestones that's worth talking about. When Taylor lost control of the music copyrights over her first six albums, she acted swiftly. Yes, there's gonna be a lot of puns in this one. She acted swiftly by re-recording her first album. But why would any musician re-record their album in a way that is almost indistinguishable from the first one? Well, we can look to another example. Like Swift, Prince signed his first music deal as a teenager. He gave Warner Brothers ownership over his entire back catalog. Prince eventually sued and changed his name to a symbol to try and stop the company from profiting on his name, and eventually hoarded his music to prevent corporations from taking control of his work. Similarly, Paul McCartney lost control of the Beatles catalog in the 1960s, and has worked for decades to get the rights to his original Beatles recordings. And that project is still ongoing. And in this context, Swift's bold decision to re-record her albums and reclaim the value of her own music will influence every artist of her generation and for generations to come. Hey Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a greedy music label executive or I guess an entrepreneurial musician. Lisa Left Eye Lopez once described the music industry as a cutthroat business full of greedy individuals who take advantage of young artists. She would know. TLC was one of the biggest acts in music when they were forced to file for bankruptcy because their original recording deal got them just 7% on the sale of each album, minus deductions for touring and promotion. Understanding music law is essential for any musician or songwriter, but it's not like there's a school of music law. And this is daunting for most people who usually have no experience in the law or drafting legal contracts when they get started in business. And in the US, the music industry is governed by the Copyright Act, but it also operates by tradition, particularly in the music publishing side of the business. So to understand what is so monumental about what Taylor Swift has done and is continuing to do, we have to learn a little bit about copyright law and the music industry. Now to help understand how this works, let's talk about a hypothetical. Let's say you're a promising singer-songwriter. You write your own music and record it in your own studio. But how do you get paid for your music? Well, it should be simple, right? You write a song, record it, release it as a digital download on your website, or on a CD, or a cassette tape, or an LP if you're a dirty hipster, and you get paid when someone buys it. You get 100% of that money. Yay! However, your ability to market your own songs is limited. How will people discover you? Where will they buy your stuff? How do you get your songs on the radio? How will you afford to tour? What if you think your music would be good in commercials or movies? Well, this is where labels and music publishers have traditionally entered the picture. So congrats, the legal eagle music label screaming eagle wants to sign you for a record deal. I'm gonna give you $100,000 in advance. You'll also assign 50% of your publishing rights to Screaming Eagle Music Publishing Co., which I own. Just sign this legally binding contract and you'll be well on your way to superstardom. And tomorrow, $100,000 will be transferred to your bank account. Sounds pretty good, right? Awesome, awesome. 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 But wait, before you say yes or no, you need to read the contract. And that's actually not what happened with Brad Paisley, because Sony refused to give Brad Paisley data on how many albums he sold because the contract footnote said he couldn't challenge royalty payments until 2006. He couldn't legally get the numbers, so the fine print matters, and in that case, he was probably shortchanged over $10 million. It all starts with knowing the difference between two different copyrights that are involved in the creation of music, and side note, there's actually at least six different copyrights that are involved when you're talking about the creation and publication of music. Music is particularly complex when it comes to copyright law. So for simplicity's sake, we're just gonna talk about the two main ones when it comes to creation. There is the musical work copyright and there is the sound recording copyright. But what rights are these? Under the Copyright Act, 17 USC section 106, the owner of a copyright in a work has certain exclusive rights to that work, including the rights to reproduce or copy that work, adapt and prepare derivative works based on the original, distribute copies of it, perform or display it publicly, 
perform a sound recording publicly by digital audio transmissions, etc. And how long do these exclusive rights last? Well, since your songs were created on or after January 1st, 1978, they last for 70 years after the death of the individual author. So let's talk about this first right, the music composition right, or the musical work copyright. It protects the underlying musical arrangement and the accompanying lyrics of a song, whether that composition is fixed in written sheet music, recorded, or otherwise. And in our hypothetical, you created a musical work all by yourself, so you own that copyright until you sign the contract, assigning it to the Screaming Eagle Music Publishing Company. And under our proposed agreement, I will let you keep 50% of the music composition rights. But that takes us to the second copyright, the sound recording copyright right, which protects the actual recording of a musical composition. This could be a recording that's contained in a CD, an MP3 file, a computer hard drive, uh, or other phono records. The Copyright Act uh, needs to update its language. But the Copyright Act defines phono records as material objects which sound is affixed to by any method now known or later developed. And under this proposed contract with Screaming Eagle Records, the label will pay for all of the musicians and the equipment that you need to record an album. The official finished sound recording will be owned by the record company. This is the version of the song that is publicly released. These are generally called master recordings and Screaming Eagle Records will not need your permission now or in the future to use these particular records or to sell them. How valuable are the masters? So valuable that everyone wants a piece of this pie. It's become a popular practice for producers and song engineers to demand a percentage of the masters for the work of their song. And sometimes this is an advantageous arrangement for musicians, but be careful because it will keep eating into your split anytime that recording is played somewhere else. So to recap under our deal, which would not be totally crazy in the music industry, Screaming Eagle owns your masters, but you get to keep 50% of the composition rights. So this seems like a pretty reasonable deal, right? Or is it? Music publishing is not something that's defined by the copyright statute. It's a music industry tradition and expectation that a music publisher will manage the composition rights. Music publishers help leverage your songs to make money and protect your catalog of songs from infringement. And generally speaking, music publishers have two significant revenue streams. There are mechanical royalties and performance royalties. A music publisher can pitch your song to other artists who may record them, or they can get music plugged into advertisements, video games, movies, and the like. This might be financially lucrative, but it still means that as the musician, you're giving up another slice of the overall pie. So when will the individual artists start earning money? Well, first you've got to ensure that you sell enough albums to make up the $100,000 advance that you signed when you signed with the label. That money was an advance, not a signing bonus. And then you have to repay the music label for any expenses it paid to help record your album, promote it, and set up your tour. TLC only got about 20 cents per album after the label deducted for dancers, sound engineers, video production, tour support, and radio promotion. Left Eye said that the group made less than 1% of the estimated $175 million in revenue that the group's music generated. So let that be a lesson. Only after you pay back the label in full will you start earning royalties on your music. But once the contract between you and the first music label ends, you might be able to sign a more lucrative deal elsewhere. However, However, the original music label will own the masters of the sound recordings in your albums for as long as it states in the contract, which could be as long as your life and then some. The label will continue to get revenue for the sale of each album and digital download that includes any of the original sound recordings. And that includes royalties or fees from the use of the sound records in any movies, films, TV shows, or advertisements. And now you know enough about copyright law and the music industry to understand what happened with Taylor Swift and Big Machine. Imagine that you signed a deal like this when you were 15 years old like Taylor Swift. In 2019, Swift was named Artist of the Decade for the six albums she made between the ages of 15 and 24, mostly while she was signed to the record label Big Machine. And not surprisingly, this soon erupted to bad blood. But the trouble began when Scooter Braun, who works with the Kardashian clan and Justin Bieber, purchased the music label Big Machine. Braun and Swift had publicly feuded in the past. And once the sale went through, that mean that Swift's masters were owned by Braun. Big Machine was estimated to be worth at least $300 million, with Swift Swift's catalog valued at about $140 million at the time. So she was responsible for almost half of the company's value. But this was not a love story. Baby, just say no, God!
No, God, please, no! When her contract was up, Swift opted not to re-sign with the company, but Big Machine was not exactly thrilled with her decision to sign with another label. So she says that they retaliated against her by refusing to allow her to perform her songs on TV and blocking her from using her recordings in the Netflix documentary about her life. Although the label denied this, the New York Times got an email showing an executive from Big Machine telling Swift's representatives that the company will, quote, not agree to issue licenses for existing records or waivers of its recording restrictions in connection with the Netflix documentary. Yes, Taylor brought the receipts. The lesson, don't second guess a mad woman. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> now, Swift tried to buy her masters from Big Machine, but Braun refused to sell them to her at any price. Braun wanted Swift to sign an NDA, muzzling her right to talk about him as a condition of negotiating. Swift said no deal. But this is a dilemma faced by many artists who try to buy back their copyrights. In the late 1960s, Paul McCartney lost his stake in Northern Songs, the publishing company that he'd set up with John Lennon. McCartney also lost control over the master recordings for the Beatles. And when McCartney worked with Michael Jackson in the 1980s, he told Jackson that it was important to own the rights to his own music. Jackson apparently uh, jokingly responded by saying, one day I'll own all of your music. And mission accomplished. Jackson responded to this advice by buying up the McCartney copyrights for himself in a backstabby joint venture with Sony ATV that cost him $47 million. For those of us who like living dangerously, this one's for you. McCartney, of course, got nothing from the deal. It also, shocker, apparently ruined the McCartney-Jackson friendship. Now, the value of the Beatles catalog soared. In 2016, Sony ATV bought the Jackson share of the Beatles songs for a whopping $750 million. But after years of litigation over whether British or American copyright law applied to the sale, McCartney finally got the chance to get his rights back using the termination provisions of the Copyright Act, which generally gives an artist an opportunity to terminate transfers 35 years after the date of transfer. But what did this mean for Taylor Swift. Well, it meant that she decided to be proactive right now to avoid ever being in the McCartney situation, which brings us to why she re-recorded her albums. 17 months after Scooter Braun purchased Big Machine, he sold the master tapes of Swift's albums to a private investment fund. The purchase price was a minimum of $300 million, which could escalate to $450 million if certain benchmarks were met. The investment funds have been scooping up music rights left and right because their value is so high. For example, in 2020, a firm purchased a 50% stake in Rick James's catalog, including both publishing and recorded masters. The song Super Freak is still one of the most sampled riffs in music and is still probably worth tens of millions of dollars, if not more. But when James died in 2003, he left an estate worth just $250,000. The investment firm that purchased the Swift masters includes the George Soros family, 23 Capital, and the Carlyle Group. According to Swift, they have not reached out to her at all, which is a strange business decision since Swift is making them money. Swift wrote, Scott Borchetta told my team that they'll allow me to use my music only if I do these things. If I agree not to re-record copycat versions of my songs next year, which is something I'm both legally allowed to do and looking forward to, and also told my team that I need to stop talking about him and Scooter Braun. Braun's response to Swift's specific allegations was basically... <laughs> He posted about kindness on Instagram and had the gall to assert that Taylor communicating with her fans, quote, greatly affects the safety of our employees and their families. So Swift just responded by re-recording her original albums. Because remember, there's two different copyrights at work here. There is the composition license, the sheet music, the melodies, the lyrics, and then there is the copyright in the sound recording itself. She didn't own the copyright in the sound recording, Big Machine and eventually the private equity firms did, but she did own the composition license. So she she just took the compositions and re-recorded them. Effectively, Swift owned the abstract version of the songs and she had the funds available to work in a studio to re-record it herself. She could hire the engineers and the other musicians to help out on the album and she could just make one that sounded identical to the original album. But you might ask, how does this re-recording impact the original masters that are now owned by a private equity firm? Well, it dilutes their values. Fans are buying the new version of the album. In fact, it went to number one on the Billboard charts. It also means that fans will stream the new versions, reducing the number of plays that the original version gets on streaming services. And any company that wants to license Taylor Swift's albums can now work directly with Swift, which cuts off income to the firm that owns the original masters. And you might think that the two different versions of the sound recordings might compete with each other, driving the price down. But in reality, people generally want to work with the original artist because that artist is going to continue making new art that they might want to license in the future. It generally 
better for a movie, game, or TV show to license the new version because they would have a good relationship with Taylor Swift, who has an entire career in front of her. So Taylor Swift made extremely important business decisions that will not only impact her, but other artists as well. The private firm that owns the original albums also probably missed an opportunity. If they had reached out to smooth things over with Swift, the value of the original masters would be intact. Instead, her fans are buying the new album, which sounds identical to the original. Swift plans to re-record her other five albums as well, and if Big Machine is bitter, I guess that they can just shake it off. What advice would you give to anyone who wants to become a singer? Um, get a good lawyer. If only I knew some music producer who could listen to the originally recorded masters and compare them to the Taylor Swift recorded versions. Man, that would be a really interesting thing to learn, especially if I knew the most preeminent music producer on YouTube. Man, that would be great. Rick, as the preeminent uh, music educator on YouTube, would you mind listening to the original version of Taylor Swift's Fear List and compare it to the new version to see if there's any differences? I will. So here's the uh, original one that was recorded and put out in 2008. Okay, if I just listen to the beginning, let's check the new one. Way better snare sound. It sounds fuller. This actually isn't fair because I listened to the two of them back to the back and the new one is far superior. Taylor's voice sounds better. The recording's better. They did a really great version of it. And the snare drum is is much better in the new one. That's that's incredible that that you can hear that much of a difference between the the two versions. They're they're pretty identical tempo wise. They must have actually overlaid them so that they got the 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 tempo right on. But you know they probably have a lot of the same. I haven't looked, but I would imagine maybe they have some of the same players playing on them. But the uh, the sonically, the new one is far better, and I think her voice sounds better on it. So over time, you think that she's become a better singer in general? Absolutely. No question about it. Interesting. Well, uh, I hope that uh, this particular video doesn't get a copyright claim, but <laughs> if it does, then I will dispute it just like we did on your channel uh, when we went through and disputed all of the copyright claims that you got on your videos because it's this video is fair use. There you go. So there you have it. To a layperson, the two songs sound pretty similar, but to the trained ear, you might even say that the new versions that are engineered by Taylor Swift herself sound even better than the originals. Her voice has matured, the technology has gotten better. So if that's the case, why would you even listen to the original masters? Why not just always listen to the Taylor Swift version? But the question is, what is Taylor going to do with all of that extra money? Well, she'll probably spend it on a great meal, but we know that Taylor likes to do things herself. So her best bet is today's sponsor, HelloFresh. Now, I am also a do-it-yourself person, and I have to say, I was initially pretty skeptical about HelloFresh. I'm a pretty good cook, so I didn't think I needed the help, but I actually loved it. Even for an experienced cook like me, HelloFresh delivers new ingredients and recipes that I'd never try on my own. Everything I've gotten from HelloFresh was insanely delicious, easy to cook, and really healthy. For example, I recently made yogurt marinated chicken with garlic sauce, pork tenderloin with cherry sauce, and meatloaf a la mom, and every single one of those was fantastic, and not something that I would have made on my own. So if you feel like you've been cooking the same thing every day in quarantine, HelloFresh is a great solution. And of course, everything was delivered straight to my door so I didn't have to do any shopping. And what's really great is the produce actually gets to you faster than it would if you bought stuff from a grocery store. So it arrives at peak freshness and flavor. And it's also super easy to save time. HelloFresh cuts out meal planning and prep so the recipes only take 20 to 30 minutes to cook, literally less time to cook than it would normally take to do the shopping. And it's also incredibly sustainable. Since the ingredients are pre-portioned, there's less prep and less less wasted food. The package is almost entirely made from recyclable or already recycled content, and HelloFresh's carbon footprint is actually 25% lower than that of meals made from store-bought groceries. So if you'd like to try HelloFresh, and I really recommend that you give it a try, you can go to HelloFresh.com and use the code LegalEagle14 to get 14 free meals. Yes, you can actually get 14 free meals plus free shipping, or you can just click on the link below. So again, for 14 free meals, go to HelloFresh.com and use the code LegalEagle14, or just click on the link that's on screen right now. Plus, clicking on this link really helps out this channel. And while you're at it, click on this playlist over here with all of my other real law reviews with explanations of today's legal news. So click on this link or I'll see you in court.